Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, everyone for joining this uh, Renew webinar. I thank my colleague, Pascal Canfin, chair of the uh, Envy Committee, for participating to this discussion. And to Ifa White, reporter from Bloomberg, we will also take part to the discussion as well as other journalists connected online. And let me um, welcome all the people connected, all the um, uh, MEPs, uh, colleagues, uh, people from the European Commission, from uh, competition authorities, from the academic and business community. Welcome to all of you. I am very, very happy to welcome today the Executive Vice President Margaret Vestager as a special guest for this Renew webinar. I am delighted to see you in real life, Margaret, and to discuss competition as we did not really have the chance to uh, have a plenary debate on the annual competition policy report in uh, plenary due to the pandemic outbreak. I'm sure that uh, you've read carefully all the proposals voted by the European Parliament to adapt our European competition rules to the 21st century. The European Commission announced its intention to review the uh, European competition rules by 2023. The work is on the way and I'm very pleased to see that some of our proposals such as the revision of the notice on market definition and the uh, ex ante regulation have already been taken on board. But we're here today to discuss more specifically how competition rules can support the Green Deal and achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. The COVID-19 crisis had, has severely hit our economy and society and the pandemic also made clear that uh, we do have to move forward quickly to a digital, green and resilient Europe. President von der Leyen reiterated this need during a speech last week on the State of the European Union and Digicom has rising up to the COVID-19 challenge, definitely. It's now time to do the same for the environmental challenge. Indeed, in response to the COVID-19 outbreak, the Commission did a tremendous work and allowed full flexibility in terms of state aid in order to provide member states with the necessary liquidity to preserve jobs. I had the occasion to update the competition policy report with some amendments regarding the consequence of the pandemic on competition policy. In this perspective, I called on the Commission to set common minimum standards in order to specify the requirement for companies receiving financial assistance to be in line with uh, ESJ criteria, environmental, social and governance criteria in order to uh, avoid different national criteria given rise to further discrepancies and in order to support the European objectives. Yesterday, yesterday, the European Commission adopted its revised guidelines on EU emission trading system and made compensation conditional, and this is quite a new and a good news, conditional upon additional decarbonization efforts by companies concerned. It's indeed a very good step. And DigiComp has been vocal on state aid and Green Deal. But Margaret, what about the future of competition policy? Are we going back to business as usual? When it comes to environment and sustainability goals, competition definitely plays a big role. But which one exactly? Competition policy cannot be a substitute to regulatory and business initiative. However, competition law is not a dogma and must be adapted to tackle all the current challenges we are facing, including the environmental one and accompany other policies. In my opinion, it does not mean that the European Commission would have to decide whether competition policy should be altered to make EU sustainable goals attainable. Competition enforcement remains crucial to ensure healthy and fair competition, to ensure that companies innovate and meet consumer, consumer needs. In the meantime, the Commission will have to prevent any potential negative side effects. So far, when we hear the business community, it seems that competition law has a chilling effect on its ability to collaborate to transition its industry towards 
a sustainable and carbon neutral economy. Companies could be provided with appropriate guidance, clarity, legal certainty and flexibility when it comes to environmental cooperation. DigiComp has done it during the COVID-19 crisis by issuing its first comfort letter since two, um, 200, 2003. In this regard, DigiComp and national competition authorities together within the ECN have a big role to play. At the core of it, DigiComp has to lead the way. In July, the Netherlands uh, Authority for Consumers and Market, Competition Authority, released its draft guidelines on uh, sustainability agreements. And indeed, it's now time for, the, for DigiComp to lead the European debate. We should avoid a patchwork of 27 approaches and maintain a minimum coherence on how we apply competition rules in the EU. And the Commission has already announced many things. The revision of the stated guidelines, the revision of the horizontal black exemption regulation, the communication on the EPCI, this important project of common European interest, and the review of the merger evaluation. Still, some questions remain. Is competition law a blocker or an enabler to environmental progress? why competition law is sometimes perceived as an obstacle. How were environmental efficiency gain factored in the assessment? And how can we measure long-term sustainable goals under Article 101, Paragraph 3? What should we expect from the horizontal block exemption regulation consultation? Do you consider setting, setting up new criteria an exemption, an exemption for government to give aid without first getting the commission approval? Could we expect a simpler procedure for EPCIs for smaller projects to be approved and contribute to environmental transition and on state aid? How could the European Commission harmonize the environmental ambition of the member state to make sure that we are moving towards a green Europe? what can should be done to enable environmental collaboration and lastly as we are not aiming to review the eu treaties or the ec mergers regulation i would be interested to know how you would consider the european parliament's role in this soft law and upcoming new guidelines so i hope you will provide us and i'm sure with some answers on this question and we will together analyze the current situation and explore some of options for the future. The floor is yours, Margaret, and thank you so much for being here. First of all, I want to thank you for inviting me to be with you today, because I'm very glad to have this chance to discuss uh, competition policy and how it can support the Green Deal. Uh, when we look around us, uh, we see the state of the environment and our climate this year. It seems pretty bleak. Uh, we all see the results of climate change in the terrifying orange skies in California. Temperatures of 38 degrees in Siberia. Feel the dirty air in our lungs that drives uh, 400,000 early deaths in Europe every year. Uh, but very often, the darkest hour is before the dawn things are changing. Uh, our world is coming to grips with the choices we need to make to protect the environment and keep, keep climate change from running out of control. The European Green Deal that aims to make Europe the first climate neutral continent by 2050. And in last week, as Stephanie said, in her State of the Union address, President von der Leyen set out our proposal to increase our 2030 targets for emission reductions from 40% to at least 55%. The Commission is also committed to put new proposals on the table by mid next year on key energy and climate legislation, including to adapt the EU emission trading system and to tighten energy efficiency rules and CO2 standards for cars, for trucks, for buses. And we will show solidarity with the most affected regions in Europe to make sure our transition is socially fair. So we're heading in the right direction. 
the task ahead, that will not be easy. And to succeed, everyone in Europe will have to play their part. Every individual, every business, every public authority. That includes, of course, the competition enforcers. And competition policy that supports the Green Deal. So the time has come to launch a European debate on how competition policy can best support the Green Deal. So in the next few weeks, we'll publish a call for contributions on some fundamental questions about how competition rules and sustainability policies, how do they work together and whether they could do that even better. Uh, we're looking for ideas and not just from competition experts, but from everyone with a stake in these issues, from industry, environmental groups, consumer organizations. Um, and we need to both work and listen fast. So we'll ask for contributions to be sent to us, to, to us by mid-November. Uh, that will allow us to plan a conference for early next year that will bring those different perspectives together. And we are open to all ideas, no matter where they come from. But we have also a realistic approach, because competition policy is not and cannot be uh, in the lead when it comes to making Europe green. There are dozens, dozens of much better, much more effective ways to drive the fundamental changes that we need, such as binding uh, targets uh, for cutting uh, carbon emissions uh, and more than a trillion euros of public investment to help reach those targets. Competition policy has to do its bits, obviously, but it cannot uh, replace the essential role of regulation. I think that basically is good news for the European Parliament. Uh, and in any case, as competition enforcers, we have our own task to carry out, protecting consumers, defending competition. And that's a task that has been given to us by the treaties and one that is essential to keep the economy working fairly for everyone, also in the green future. So competition policy is not going to take the place of environmental laws or green investment. The question is rather if we can do more to apply our rules in a way that better supports the Green Deal. Why competition policy is already uh, ahead? Well, Competition rules, they already play quite a vital supporting role in helping to achieve uh, green goals. Uh, competition drives the innovation that develops new technologies. They will help us more with less harm to the environment. Uh, competition only also helps to keep prices down so that we can more easily afford to invest in going green. That could mean paying a few thousand euros less to buy an electric car, few hundred thousand less for a giant wind, wind turbine. And competition gives industry a very powerful incentive to use our planet's scarce resources efficiently. In a market that's competitive, companies have no choice but to keep down the cost of doing business, which includes using less resources like raw materials and energy. But of course, they'll only do that if those resources are costly. If industry can just emit as much pollution as it likes while leaving the rest of us to pick up the bills, well, then no amount of competition will fix that market failure. So uh, competition enforcement works best as a green policy when it works hand in hand with regulation that make company bear the cost of the harm they do. And when we enforce our rules on antitrust and mergers, we defend the competition that helps green regulation to achieve their goals. With the right incentives com from competition and public policies, European businesses will be well placed to become world leading climate efficient businesses able to thrive in tomorrow's green economy. And I think that is, that is maybe even more true for our state aid rules. Uh, to achieve our green goals, Europe will need a huge amount of sustainable uh, investment. Uh, and though a lot of money uh, will have to come from private business, we'll need the catalyst of public spending to make it happen fast enough. And that is why more than a third, at least 37% of the 670 billion euros 
from Europe's new recovery and resilience facility will have to go to projects that pursue Europe's green deals. And this is also why our state aid rules encourage green investment with conditions that help to make sure that investment is done in the most productive, most efficient, most affordable way. Uh, last year, uh, we approved a plan for seven uh, EU countries to jointly invest more than 3 million uh, euros in what we call an IPCI, an important project of common European interest. That aims to develop innovative and greener batteries. And those batteries, they will help us shift from fossil fuel. They'll also be made and recycled sustainably so a healthier climate doesn't come with the cost of more pollution. Uh, this is a project that is clearly good news. We just have to make sure that it didn't undermine competition. Otherwise, we'll end up with higher prices, less innovation for batteries in the future. So we made sure that the money went to many different companies, not just a few, and that the key result, they will be shared widely with scientists and with the whole of European industry. The state air rules also play a vital role in helping to make sure that green transition is affordable. They make sure that aid doesn't go in, in, uh, in the amount that they, they don't go beyond the amount that is really needed and that taxpayers' money is not wasted on investment that the private sector would have made anyway. Uh, for instance, our rules, um, they started to require competitive tenders for aid to big renewable plants. The cost of that aid had come down incredibly fast. Uh, in Germany, the cost of supporting uh, solar power has been cut in half. Some offshore wind products in Europe, they now happen with no subsidy at all. Uh, our rules on state aid for energy and environment, well, they help to make all of this possible. And we need to make sure that those rules are ready for a vast increase in green investment, the one that we think is coming. So in the next few weeks, we launch a consultation on those state aid rules. We want to make sure that they give Europe's governments all the scope they need to make those green investments without wasting taxpayers' money by greenwashing uh, what is really an unsustainable race between EU uh, countries to pop up their national industries. Uh, we also want to have a look at whether uh, too much state aid is being used to protect some energy intensive users from having to bear their environmental costs of energy use. The aid can stop emissions from moving outside of Europe, yes, but it doesn't help us decarbonize our economy and it leaves other industries with even more to do to reach their green goals. Uh, and this is why we've just updated our rules on state aid to help energy intensive industries deal with higher electricity prices for the EU emission trading system. In those rules, we made sure that only industries that, fare, that face a, a genuine uh, risk of carbon leakage, because those costs, well, they can get help. Uh, we have also required them to improve uh, their energy efficiency in return for aid, as Stephanie just mentioned. Uh, and we'll have to examine whether our rules for state aid uh, for environmental protection and energy should also contribute to redressing uh, this balance. In the green transition, well, competition rules, they are not the engine of change. They are the that is the job of regulation and investment. But they are a vital part of the transition, which links that engine to the wheels and produces results on the ground. And the question we're asking is when this, in this new public debate, is whether we could do more to keep that transition working smoothly and helping to reach the goals of the Green Deal. A large part of the state aid that governments give today already supports environment, cleaner energy. But we still want to see if there is a way to make the rest of Europe's state aid spending greener, because we're talking billions and billions. And one possibility might be to give an incentive to governments that thinks green, 
that require the building projects they fund to use recycled materials, to take just one example. Uh, our rules, they set limits on how much a project can be financed with public money, again, to make sure that the private sector also contribute. And we could think of giving a sort of green bonus, which allows government to use more state aid for projects that makes a, a genuine contribution to our green goals. We could also look at how to build on the success of competitive tenders in keeping renewable costs down by seeing if we could extend that approach to other areas. At the other end of the scale, from this kind of encouragement, we could look at the possibility of firm rules requiring that aid doesn't undermine the Green Deal. We might refuse to approve aid that could harm the environment or would keep polluting factories or power plants operating. Obviously, that would have to happen within the limits of the treaty and in line with the rights of member states. We also want to see if the, well, how can you put it, if the way we apply our antitrust uh, rules could do more, uh, more to support industry's efforts to become uh, greener. Uh, we only reach our green goals if everyone, including businesses, take their share of responsibility. So, several of Europe's national competition authorities are looking at how antitrust rules could help support industry's green project. Uh, in July this year, uh, the Dutch Competition Authority, they proposed new draft guidelines, which aims to make it easier for companies to agree to produce greener products without breaking competition rules. And, uh, and in the just few days, the Greek Competition Authority published a very interesting paper which looks at how competition policy could contribute to support more the green transition. And these are vital questions for our green future. And the public debate that we're launching will give us the chance uh, to look at those issues with the European perspective to avoid the fragmentation that Stephanie also mentioned. We welcome it when companies decide to work together to help them to move to green even faster. And our rules make sure that those sustainability agreements are done in a way that doesn't undermine competition and harm European consumers. But we know that in practice, it's not always easy for companies to be sure that their agreements fall on the right side of the line. So we're looking at how, can, how can we give more, more clarity, more comfort in our guidance on horizontal agreement between companies. We are ready to give comfort in the right cases that particular agreements, they're in line with the rules. And that will give companies real world examples as to what they can rely on. And I want to encourage businesses to get in touch with us if they think they have a good candidate for that guidance. So, to conclude, because the green transition is bigger than any of us, well, we need an effort for the whole society to make sure that we get on the right track. It's a big challenge for competition enforcers, but it's also a reminder that we can't do it all. It is a, it's a team effort. And uh, none of us has to be, or can be, the saver of Europe's environment on our own. So our debate on greening competition policy, while that is taking shape, we won't be competing to win applause by single-handedly make Europe green. Instead, we want to find uh, the right place in the team that will make sure that we live a healthier world for our children. And in that, of course, we want to work not only with you, but with the European Parliament and the national parliaments. So in that respect, thank you. And I hope this will be a beginning of a beautiful cooperation. Thank you very much, very, very much, dear Margaret, for these very interesting announcements. It is good to see that the Commission has no taboo. And the debate is now open and we will have a lot of things to discuss in the near future. And through this public and collective debate, I'm glad that the Europa, uh, European Parliament will contribute to uh, define a competition policy that could support reaching a sustainable economy. Now we'll now give the floor to my colleague Pascal Canfin. He's uh, the chairman of the uh, NV committee at the European Parliament. And I'm sure 
he has some interesting views in this upcoming debate. Pascal, the floor is yours. Hi, can you hear me? Uh -huh. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. You do? Okay, great. So I, I have a very poor connection. So I prefer to stay on the audio mode, if you don't mind. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Yeah, we can. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So, uh, well, first of all, thank you, Stephanie, for organizing this uh, uh, hearing and this discussion because uh, uh, it's at the heart of the mindset we are in uh, within Renew. And of course, thank you very much for, for Margarita to first to join and to uh, make some uh, very important an announcements. So I, I, as you said, Margarita, that you welcome uh, non-expert point of views. <laughs> so I'm not a competition policy expert. So I feel comfortable <laughs> being part of this discussion as a non-competition policy expert. Um, precisely because I think we need to uh, uh, not to have any taboo, as you said, Stephanie, uh, even if we have the treaties. So there are limits to what we can do, and we know that, and it's good to have this. But within these limits, we shouldn't have any taboo. And I think uh, what is interesting is that you set, to my view, rightly the scene, meaning that it's not competition policy instead of usual regulation policies like uh, ETS or, or standards on buildings or CO2 uh, emissions and so on. It's uh, on top of that. And that's exactly, uh, if I take uh, another sphere of uh, or fields of public policies, it's the, the, the financial sector, financial regulation. I mean, five years ago, a lot of people still in the financial community considered that it was not their job to contribute to the Green Deal or to the Green Transition. Uh, they just say, well, let's put a price on carbon and everything will be set. And now it's very, very clear that we have changed this man mindset. And uh, from the Commission perspective, but also from the European Central Bank, the Eurozone Central Bank perspective, and through uh, financial uh, regulatory bodies, they all consider they all consider that contributing to the Green Deal by changing the financial regulation rules are part of their mandate. Why? Because the climate change and, and biodiversity laws, but of course, everybody has climate change in mind. So climate change is now perceived as a systemic risk, which means there is a, a legitimacy within the current mandate for financial bodies such as, or regulatory bodies such as uh, the ECB or, or, or National uh, Eurozone System, to step in. And it was a very important conceptual change because up to that from, up to that change or before that change, many voices considered that it was not part of the current mandate. So first we have to change the mandate of the ECB and then we will discuss. And because now everybody considers that climate change is a systemic risk for the financial sector, then within the mandate, without having any change within the treaties and, and the ideological debate about it, you, we can act. And that's why the ECB is working on now a new doctrine and new uh, tools. Uh, why did I give this example? Because I think that's where we are in now for competition policy. What is the concept or what are the concepts you can use are, as competition policy experts, which I'm not, to connect competition policy tools and legitimacy and, and goals, which is your mandate, Margarita, and which is the mandate of the Commission, <laughs> very strong in that field, and the Green Deal. And I think it's at the heart of the discussion uh, for the consultation you are, you are opening uh, today. Second remark, it's not up to you to say as, as competition experts or as competition or uh, executive VP for, for that, to say, well, uh, what is green is that, what is not green is this. I mean, we are building a tool, which is a common tool, which is the taxonomy. And I guess that one part of the discussion should be how to connect the taxonomy and the state aid. 
regulation. Exactly as we connected the taxonomy and the recovery plan or the taxonomy and uh, the just tradition found or the taxonomy and the uh, 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 ECB uh, future regulation. So my second comment would be, please use the taxonomy as a basis for not reinventing the wheel and saying, well, what is green, what is not green, what is helpful for the transition, what is not helpful for the transition. But it gives you the field, it gives you the ground to start, as you said, making differences, let's say, uh, uh, the applying different rules for technologies, for companies, for projects that are helpful for the transition on one side and that are harmful for the transition on the other side. And the examples you gave, to my view, go definitely in the right direction, uh, allowing uh, more uh, uh, industrial alliances like on batteries or allowing uh, various players to collaborate, to cooperate on a value chain in order to deliver green transition at scale. It's exactly what we need and that would be such a pity that competition policy would uh, block that or would, be, uh, uh, would not enable it. And uh, to my view, one big new uh, field is uh, buildings, uh, refurbishing. Because if we want it to be at scale, which is the goal of the renovation wave, which is another project coming for, out of from the commission uh, in uh, October, I think, um, we will need much more cooperation between all the uh, uh, elements of the value chain, private and public. So more cooperation means a bit less competition and we need to adjust the rules for uh, being able to uh, scale up massively uh, the renovation of buildings. My very last remark, Stephanie, would be uh, maybe on something which is today not in the scope of uh, the, the, the current thinking of the, uh, uh, the DJ Comp. It's about externalities. I mean, when you apply competition policies, you apply competition, competition rules within uh, factors that are factored in by the market. So the price, uh, the data you have access to, uh, the, the level of, uh, of uh, te the, the, the technology and things like that. Things that are known and taken into account at the end of the day by the market prices. And externalities per nature are not covered by market prices because they are precisely externalities, otherwise they would be internalities. It means that a lot of te green technologies compete with non-green technologies or if I reframe it, green technologies might sometimes have difficulties to access the market because they might be, for instance, a bit uh, too cost, uh, more costly, precisely because they take into account externalities which are not taken into account by other technologies. And of course, if you put out of the market price a lot of externalities and nobody pays the price for it, uh, when I say nobody, I should say nature pay the price for it and then it's us, but as us as a society, not us as a company, then is it, is it still a fair competition? And that's, that's, I think, something you should investigate into and look at closely. Because if you are able to change the concept of what is internalities and externalities in the connection between competition rules and Green Deal, then you would I think that would be clearly a game changer. That would be a game changer in many, many uh, sectors. So that's what I, I wanted to say. And thank you, uh, uh, Margarita, for your, your leadership on this topic. And thank you, uh, Stephanie, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much, Pascal, for, for these very interesting uh, views. I'm sure you would have some very useful one. So um, now, um, thanks a lot. Um, let me now give the, the floor to uh, Ifa, Ifa White. She's a reporter from Bloomberg and uh, she would like, I think, to react on this and, and, and set up the media perspective. Ifa, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you, Stephanie. 
Aoife? Um, I was asked to give a media perspective. Um, I wanted to say that there's a lot of goodwill in the media and, and even in the corporate world to talk about and meet climate change objectives. Many of us know it's an important goal. Some media organizations try to devote a lot of attention to it. I know we do at Bloomberg. We try to tell stories about climate change, but also about solutions, offer data, whether it's tree loss or carbon free energy. But to talk to policymakers about this, I have a plea. Green policy initiatives are very hard to communicate and they can be very hard for us to write about. They often come across as vague and abstract. There's a lot of jargon in both environmental and competition policy. We've got IPCI, EEAG, GBAR. But this can be hard, this can sound like meaningless blah blah sometimes and it's hard to show that something meaningful is happening. And sometimes there isn't something meaningful happening. We all see a lot of greenwashing where companies and governments pretend to do more than they are. We've seen disappointments where targets haven't been taken seriously and haven't been hit or even abandoned. And one question I have to the MEPs and to Mrs. Vestager is, is, is this time different? And how are you going to make sure that it will go differently? We know competition law has its own aims, not to keep sure, make sure that there aren't excessive prices to make sure companies compete fairly. If we go a little bit further than that, if we talk about consumer welfare in a time of climate crisis, should we make emissions reductions an aim for competition law enforcement? Mrs. Vestager talked about a green bonus for state aid. Do you see interest from member states in spending more of their own money on green projects? I mean, we have seen issues before and potential problems here with premiums for solar panels. You also mentioned firmer rules that could stop aids to polluting plants. And to be a devil's advocate here, there are a lot of opinions about what a polluting industry is. Would that also include an airline or a car maker, a data company running a large number of power hungry servers? And a lot of governments are under pressure to give aid that cushions the blow of the green transformation. It sometimes becomes a debate about jobs over emissions cuts. Do you expect a lot of pushback on potentially ending aid to these companies? Important projects of common European interest. Can you be a little bit more concrete about what kind of project should happen here? I mean, maybe MEPs have ideas about what's needed. And do we risk also that we create white elephants and something that takes a lot of public money at projects that won't or can't happen? And we've seen cartels emerge from crises before and fines for companies that hold talks and environmental aim that go a little bit too far. Can the commission give clearer lines on how far is too far? Or is this something where we're going to need a specialist, a competition lawyer in the room to say stop when the discussion spills over onto prices or onto quotas? Should companies be talking to the commission first before they talk to each other? And to ask a slightly nerdy competition question, will we see more comfort letters here? I very much look forward to hearing some of your answers. Yeah, thank you, Ifa, for these uh, very good questions. And Margaret, I suggest you uh, start replying before uh, we open the Q&A uh, session. Uh, well, these are very tricky questions. Um, and one of the reasons why we are uh, launching now a public debate is, of course, to get more answers. Uh, that I would be able to give, uh, because that is not the point uh, just for, for one person to say, well, this is the line and here we go. It is indeed to consult, to hear many views, let them come together and then take a specific uh, direction. Um, also because I agree, uh, there's a lot of jargon um, and there is a risk of greenwashing. Uh, one of the things that made me appreciate how far we have come uh, in environmental changes when we had the first um, cartel uh, within recycling. Now the, the circular economy is so advanced in some sectors that some even think that it is worthwhile to make a cartel here. This was a buying cartel in, in used uh, car batteries. Uh, but I think it's, it also shows that we also need to stay vigilant that some will do sort of very old school things that will harm consumers. Uh, from getting the best possible prices uh, and new sectors will emerge where it's important that we get also a very healthy uh, structure within that marketplace. Um, to have these Im important projects of, uh, of common European interest, uh, I think one, one rule of thumb is that there should be a, a market failure to solve. Uh, for instance, in, in, the, in the battery uh, project that is ongoing, Part of that is to develop how to recycle batteries so that we don't use to need to have a lot of them, use them once and then try to scrap it. How to circulate batteries and also when they cannot be circulated anymore, how to reuse the materials that goes into it. 
it is not just for one business to organize this or to figure out what is the best possible way of organizing it. The entire industry, when it comes to batteries, will benefit from having such a system and will sort of reduce the, the amount of resources that we use. So it, it's very important for me to say that it's not only sort of technological innovation, it's not only technological market failures that we're looking for, it's also when there is a market failure that systems and way of organizing doesn't develop by itself. Um, and the second thing is that it's important for small and medium-sized businesses to be able to take part. Uh, right now, it is, I think, a bit complicated, also because it's a combination of multiple uh, member states, many more businesses, and the Commission to check if, if this is sufficiently uh, innovative. Uh, so we would want to make sure that also smaller businesses can be part, because everyone should be uh, invited uh, if they want to be, you know, uh, in the cutting edge of some of these uh, developments here. So this is what we're trying to do, to simplify, but also to invite smaller companies uh, on board. Uh, Europe is a continent of small and medium-sized businesses, so it would be, I think, uh, very awkward uh, not to do that. And the last thing that I will uh, comment uh, in, in this uh, section is this question about uh, when we talk about cooperation, when is it too far? Well, coordination on prices, uh, deciding that I produce four and you produce four, even though the market is asking for ten, that, of course, also is a no-go. Uh, because here we sort of leave out the consumer. And, and I think it's very important to make sure that every consumer also feel that they have a role to play in this transition. Because it, it is not just for businesses, it's not just for the regulator, it is for everyone to take part in this. Um, but, but the balancing act, when we will give guidance in cooperation, of course, is a tricky one. Uh, and this is why I invite businesses who, who think that they have a good candidate uh, for us to give guidance and for other businesses to learn, to come forward and say, we plan to do this, but we've been kind of scared away. But if invited, we will put this uh, project on your table and ask for the guidance so that we have the certainty that we can push uh, this one forward. Well, thank you, Margaret. And thanks again uh, to all the uh, uh, MEPs uh, present and uh, connected, as well as all the uh, Commission representatives, journalists and all stakeholders we, who follow these uh, webinar on the streaming platform. Um, so before I uh, ask people to take the, the floor, I think we have some uh, uh, we have two um, MEPs uh, which couldn't make it and they took a large part in the competition uh, report. So I'd like to, uh, um, uh, I'd like to just, uh, uh, yeah, well, I'd apologize because, uh, for example, my colleague Carmen Avrap, she was shadow for the uh, competition policy report and could uh, unfortunately not join us to Today. She's got one question for you, Margaret. Um, how uh, to avoid abuses when promising the greening of the economy when receiving state aid? And some big companies, airlines, that have received millions of taxpayers' euros might promise a greening of their business model. We will check they actually do. Maybe another one from my colleague, Carlin Carsbro, Renew. She um, would want to ask how the competition policy could be used to remove and pull back subsidies which harm the environment, such as subsidies that go to uh, fossil fuels. And after that, I'll, um, uh, maybe I have a question directly from uh, Irene, Irene Tolleray. Can you hear me? Oui, je t'entends très bien. Ah. In, Alors, back, yes, I hear you. Can you hear me? Is it yeah. good? Yes, yes, it is. I have a question. I think you have. You can listen to the interpreter. So, to promote the Green Deal through competition policy, you have the agriculture. We have expectations from our citizens that are very important regarding agriculture because from farm to fork, 
strategy is key. This is about the health of our citizens and about the future of citizens and farmers. So my question is regarding agriculture and the CAP and the Green Deal. Can't we make everything flexible? It seems I have some issues with my connection. Can you hear me? So we have to make the requirements flexible when you have groups of producers, they have requirements, but those requirements should be more flexible when they implement green measures. Farmers going for the Green Deal and re uh, respecting the farm to fork strategy should not be impeded by the measures we implement and by the competition policy, especially now, given that we are facing a huge crisis with COVID-19. The European Commission has improved the competition area recently in order to improve position of farmers within the uh, food uh, chain. However, there were no impacts so far. Would the European Commission be ready to bring more flexibility in the agricultural area in order to um, reach the goals of the Green Deal by focusing, as Pascal said, on the taxonomy? We don't have to reinvent the wheel, but by making everything more flexible, couldn't we support farmers that are going towards the Green Deal? And thank you, Margaret and Stephanie, you are doing great. Creating two competitions. So I suggest maybe, Margaret, if you would like to uh, reply to the three questions, and then I have many other questions from MEPs and from the journalists later on. Stay tuned. Well, I, I'm afraid that this will, uh, this will show how much you know as MEPs and, and how little I know, uh, because I'm not uh, completely sharp on what will, what will be the effect once sort of there is agreement on the farm to fork proposal, because it is still under discussion yeah. right now. Yeah. What will be the effect of, of that uh, compared to competition policy? I would, I would think uh, that the most important thing is to implement or agree on the farm to fork strategy before we get there. And, and last year, uh, Parliament and Council agreed on, on new rules as to how farmers can organize themselves uh, in order to have a more balanced, uh, more balanced power in the value chain from the initial producer and the farmer, uh, the many uh, sort of middlemen before you get to, to the retailer. Very often the retailers are also quite big. And, and one of the things that, that we saw in that legislation is a lot of flexibility. Uh, one of the things that we have also documented is that when farmers come together and, and uh, have common resources, like in storage uh, and, uh, and, um, and transportation to get uh, their produce uh, to the next part of, of the value chain, they make more uh, themselves. So I think, I think we need to push with the rules that are made already uh, because a lot of flexibility is in there. I, I, I share the, the impatience that very often you are uh, courageous and, and you get new rules in place and then it takes some time before one sees the full effect. Uh, because obviously once we have decided something, it's on paper. It's when, for instance, in this situation, farmers do something different and feel that they have different options, that things, uh, things really start to change. Um, on fossil fuels, um, it is uh, one of the tricky things here is that a lot of the fossil fuel uh, support comes from taxation, uh, which is uh, out of uh, out of my uh, limits. It's not so much uh, for for competition. Where we have had uh, a, a, an approach to that would be when it comes to gas. Uh, when it comes to diversify our supply, for instance, to enable liquid uh, gas uh, to be used in Europe. I tend to see that as a good thing because we need something in between uh, coal and all renewables. Uh, and here, gas, I think you lose 60% of the carbon emissions uh, when you go to gas. So here we have felt that it was completely justified with the state aid that has been put into enabling some of these uh, gas uh, installations. 
uh, also competition law enforcement has enabled that the prices of these gas installation is as low as possible. Uh, we had a merger um, now five years ago where we saw that European uh, technology of really big gas turbines was at the risk of being scrapped because of a merger. Uh, and then we only approved the merger when that European technology was sold off to a third party who now has this new technology up and running so that they can compete with European technology for the best and most efficient use of the gas resource uh, that we have. And that is, of course, kind of a mixed answer because it shows that sometimes actually support to fossil fuel can be well argued because it's a stepping stone uh, to something uh, even greener, but to get out of, for instance, uh, lignite uh, and hard coal as, a, as an alternative uh, instead. On, um, uh, on the first uh, question, um, this is very embarrassing. I, I cannot read my own notes. Will you reiter reiterate the question? Yeah, sure. How to avoid abuses when promising the greening of the economy when receiving state aid? And so big companies like airlines um, receive billions of taxpayers' euro. might promise a greening of their business model, but we will check this afterwards. This is, of course, an excellent question. We were in this quite tricky uh, position when, when the COVID lockdown also locked down a lot of companies and, uh, and some companies really needed help. That the logic of our rules is not to make you do something, it's just ah, to compensate you to make go uh, so that you're not better off than what you were before. So we could not make it a prerequisite that you should do ABC. But of course, we, we welcome, we try to inspire uh, governments to say, we will help you out, but then you will have to sort of follow uh, our objectives here. And we have seen that in some member states that they said, we'll help you out, but we have expectations of you when it comes to greening. So obviously the first one to call upon the companies to, to, say, to do what they say, said they wanted to do is for the governments. Uh, because then it comes as a condition with the aid given and then the first one to, to check uh, would be the government uh, by themselves. Okay, many thanks. Many thanks, Margaret. So I think now we've, we're having uh, many questions from the journalists, actually. So I... Um, can they raise hands or...? I have uh, Philippe Dumas from Eject Geothermal. Uh, Thibault Larger. Sorry. Yeah, Thibault Larger from Politico's got a question. Go ahead, Thibault. Hello, Hello, every Hello everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, thanks for the great announcement. Um, so you said uh, earlier that competition policy cannot be in the lead. Uh, but there are already governments such as France and, and Germany who often said that competition rules under investment in Green Deal. And, uh, so my question was, how can you make sure that they do not hide between, behind competition enforcement and do not shirk their responsibility in setting the right standard and taking the right decisions? On the chat box, can people reply and, and say whether they hear or not the answer? It's not, it's good. On now. Vous entend. We hear okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Margaret. It's not, it's not okay. It was, there was something going wrong. I think the short version of my answer would be that um, 
that I don't know. Uh, because it's quite rare that I hear that competition rules is against, is between you and all the green things that you want to do. Uh, and this is not because I don't hear criticism of competition rules. I do quite often, uh, that being said. So, no, I don't have a feeling that governments are hiding behind competition rules when it comes to, uh, uh, to greening uh, their economy. Um, on the contrary, we've been working a lot with governments, for instance, to do the tendering. Of, uh, of renewable resources, and, and they have with us seen how prices have come down. So actually, no, I, I, don't, I don't see that a lot. Okay, we now have um, Ares Guillaich uh, from Emlex. Maybe uh, Javier Espinosa from FT as well? Well, Ares Guy, you can, you can start okay. and then we'll check later on whether we have uh, Javier and Funyu Chen from Reuters and Elena Sanchez from EU Observer. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Stephanie. Uh, thank you, Madam Commissioner, for uh, your intervention and for your proposals. Uh, you mentioned at IPCI and uh, the, the projects on, on battery. And um, uh, I wanted to have some more clarification. Are you expecting more? Uh, IPCR and uh, a search of IPCR in the coming month and following the proposal you may make on uh, sustainability? Yes, uh, we expect a, a second one on batteries. Uh, many more member states are coming forward uh, and many more businesses. So we are still in the process of, of seeing if it has sort of the right uh, innovative uh, scale. Uh, we're also in the beginning of discussing an, an IPCI on um, uh, microprocessors. We have one already, so that may be enlarged. Uh, here there is a clear green component as well as in batteries because a lot of our technology uses a lot of electricity. Uh, so we need uh, a new generation of uh, microprocessors of, uh, of chips that will uh, use less energy. Uh, and that, of course, would be a very, very good uh, innovative uh, approach. Uh, and also within uh, the Hydrogen Alliance, uh, I would think that an, an, a, an important project of common European interest would be created. Within this, these rules, we can both promote uh, innovation if it is, you know, groundbreaking, but we can also um, subsidize or member states can subsidize uh, infrastructure. And here, actually, when it comes to hydrogen, we may need both. But also when it comes to Green Deal, I think hydrogen is a very welcome message. Uh, eventually, uh, it will not only be clean, it will also be green because you can transform uh, renewable energy uh, into hydrogen. So hydrogen can work as a kind of battery or a place where you can actually save energy. So these are, I think, the most promising uh, things. What I'm actively promoting is, of course, that all member states feel welcome to be part of these projects. And businesses uh, who want to be part of it, who want to invest themselves and, and have, you know, these cutting edge innovative products, that they also see that they are welcome no matter what member states uh, they come from. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have a Fu Yun Chi from Reuters? Uh, maybe Maori? I think, Mari, you're online. Would you like to... Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Yes. Can you hear you me? Can. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, for your very encouraging comments. I would like to say that for your very encouraging comments. Why? Why I say so? Because I think that it's also very important that the level playing fields are needed to be uh, true also inside green investment sector, not only between in, uh, green in, uh, deal sector and other sectors, but also inside a green deal or green, let me say, green investment sectors. I'm sure that uh, in, in coming uh, months and years, we will see many kinds of uh, um, green projects and so on. 
and between them, it's very important that the level playing fields uh, are, are, are true also there. I only have one question because uh, the minimis, 200,000, it is not so it's a big issue, but in any way, throughout the Europe, it's a quite a big issue. I think that uh, I have understood that the maximum is now 200,000 plus 800,000 euros together, about 1 million euros grant. Can you be sure? I'm, uh, actually, in, in this way, uh, what is your opinion? How long this uh, 1 million maximum is open uh, in markets? Um, I have understood that. Uh, that the end will come in a few months, but I have understood that it's possible that, that that will continue. How do you see this issue? Thank you very much. It is very important uh, to have clarity on this um, because these rules, sort of the traditional de minimis of 200,000, and then a grant of 800,000 is something that we have uh, set in motion, especially for the COVID uh, situation. It's, it's a temporary thing. Uh, it has proven very, very useful because many businesses uh, obviously suffer from, from this uh, terrible situation. Uh, so I myself is, is leaning towards saying we should prolong this. Uh, and we are now in the process of uh, asking member states. Uh, for instance, I, I asked a question in the Compet Council I was in last Friday. Uh, my feeling was that uh, uh, the huge majority of member states would want a prolongation because they see the sa same thing as we do, that unfortunately many, many businesses will still be challenged uh, because of uh, COVID uh, for quite some time uh, yet to come. So that is a decision to be taken uh, within the coming weeks, because as you say, otherwise uh, these rules, they will end by uh, 1st of January. Uh, the second, your remark, I'll just say, I very much agree on this, that we also need level playing field within green, um, because we also need the push, uh, no matter how much money we have, you need the push, the drive to innovate, because, uh, creating new technologies, creating new ways of using existing technology. Well, all of that needs to drive. And that drive comes from competition. And, and this is, of course, why level playing field also within green is of crucial importance. So I really appreciate uh, this comment. I think it is spot on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mari. We have, um, I think, back online, uh, Fu Yung Chi from Reuters. Yun Chi, are you online? Are you here with us? Uh, yes, hi, it's uh, Yun Chi. Uh, hi, uh, 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 Vice President, uh, could you, um, be, can you provide some details on the green bonus that you mentioned in your speech? I mean, what kind of projects would be suitable for receiving a green, for receiving a green bonus? Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, can you repeat it, please? For you and she, we, we have bang, background noise or something. Oh, hi. Is it, is, it, is it better now? It's a bit better. Okay. Well, I, I was just wanted you know, to know if uh, the vice president can provide a bit more details on the green bonuses that she was thinking of, of uh, giving companies and, and governments for green projects. Thank you. An absolutely gen, uh, genuine one, as, as well as the other questions that we are, are posing. Um, because on the one hand side, you can say, well, if you, if you do something and uh, the rest of companies do not do it the best possible green way, um, that could sort of give you a bonus, especially if, if you have more costs. Um, maybe it would also just be solved because the... Um, the funding gap is maybe slightly bigger if the green solution is more expensive. That could, of course, then be counter-argued to say, well, if you are greener, then in the long term, you won't have the same energy uh, costs uh, as others would have. 
So we are trying to figure out, would this be a, a good incentive uh, to give a, a green bonus uh, on things, uh, or would it be better to say, well, others cannot have the same level of funding if they are not doing the green thing? So it's it's a, it's a balancing act here, um, and and the, the things that we tried sort of in the framework of uh, of, uh, of the temporary framework, the temporary state aid rules. I, I don't think that has really taken off. So so we're really interested in, in hearing views as to how to make this work. Okay, thank you. Now we are moving to Philippe Dumas from uh, EJEC, you know, the European Geothermal Energy Council. To Margaret, um, we are concerned by the significant competitive distortion caused by regulations relating to the internal market for gas, which gives it a dominant market position at the expense of competition from renewable heating and cooling services, particularly from geothermal energy. Could you ensure fair competition for heat services in the EU? Uh, well, the, thought, this, the short answer is maybe. Um, I, this is a thing that I would, uh, would want to discuss with my colleague responsible mm -hmm. for the single market, uh, to see to what degree would that be uh, single market rules, uh, competition rules, that is between a fair competition between different uh, sources of energy. Um, so I would, be, I would be more than happy to do that. I myself come from a country with a lot of uh, district heating and district cool, uh, distant uh, cooling also being more and more uh, the thing. Um, so I think I, I get your drift, uh, but I would want to, to uh, talk with Thierry to say, well, what is it? Is it single market issues or, or where, is, uh, where is it? And, and I'd be more than happy to have also more details uh, from your side on, uh, on these questions. So, Mr. Dumas, you'll have a follow-up of this question. So that's the very, uh, that's a bonus for you then, after the green bonuses. <laughs> uh, now we, we're having a very interesting, I mean, we, all the questions are interesting, but one very interesting from Nicolas Chavonon Valadez, is student at the College of, uh, College of Europe, College of Bruges. Um, he understands that hand-in-hand -hand cooperation with other parts of e-regulation is important, but before being consumers, Consumers are citizens. Shouldn't the notion of consumer welfare be interpreted more broadly than just consumer choice and low prices, allowing competition law to tackle other issues? Yes, this is indeed a, a very good question. Um, we have already a somewhat broader uh, idea about uh, how consumers should be served. Uh, uh, competitive prices, uh, choice, but also innovation. Uh, that you don't uh, kill innovation while, you, uh, while you're looking for, for cheaper prices. One of the things that I really appreciate is the role of the legislator. Uh, I think it's very important that also competition law respects that there are a framework set by the legislator. That can be on social issues, that can be on environmental issues, that can be on carbon emissions. That, uh, that the legislator should decide that, and then within that framework, the consumer should have the best possible products when it comes to prices, quality, choice, uh, innovation. Uh, but I think it's important not to mix things up, because I also want companies who are not in the process of merging or receiving aid to live up to the things that parliamentarians have set as the framework. Uh, because when it comes to sort of environment, that could be the use of pesticides. Um, a, a company should abide to those rules, even though if they are completely clear of any competition issue. And, and I think that is the balance uh, that we should discuss. And this is, of course, why I, I have this insistence uh, that the regulator has a very, very important role in making us go in the right direction. Thank you. Now we're having uh, Javier Espinosa from the Financial Times back. Hello, Javier. Can, Can you, you hear me okay? You new... yeah. uh, you I'm sorry, um, I'm still having trouble uh, with technology, but I promise one day I'll master Zoom. But uh, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity 
to let me speak. Uh, I just wanted to ask a little bit about the timeline after the consultation. So October, November, you said next year there's going to be a conference. So how many people you expect uh, to take part? And also, do you think that it might be, I understand that when the state aid came into full force at the start of the crisis, there was an urgency to act fast and go, go, go. But doesn't this come a bit too late? Shouldn't these have been incentives that were uh, part of, you know, the state aid to like the big airlines that are, as we know, massive polluters? That's my question. Thank you very much. Um, well, I, I live in the hope that we will be able to meet in person again. I, I hope a lot of people share that hope with me. Uh, and, and this is why we would want to have uh, the conference in the beginning of the next year, so that we would hope that people could actually come together. Uh, because I regret everything that I have ever said about conferences. Uh, I, I'm afraid the universe somehow heard it and, and ruined the concept. No, I, I really hope that we will be able to come together uh, maybe sometime late January, uh, February. Uh, and we now set this deadline, deadline mid-November so that we will have time to uh, consume, to read through in order for the conference to be really effective uh, and be able to give uh, conference participants sort of food for thought uh, from what comes uh, from the public. And as said, that can be members of parliament, it can be NGOs, it can be business association, anyone who feels that they have a stake in, in these issues. Uh, so, so this is uh, sort of the most immediate timeline. The second thing is that uh, now we have the temporary framework and as said, uh, we are sort of leaning uh, towards uh, uh, extending or, or prolonging it. Uh, it may all also be here where we could then see if, if something is needed for the, uh, for the recovery. Uh, if we need sort of uh, state aid rules to, while sort of we phase out the COVID-related um, uh, issues and, and phase in the recovery, that the two things can actually meet each other so that we avoid uh, value being lost or, or jobs being lost uh, for that matter. So it is a bit tricky. On the question of, of incentives, as said, um, I think a, a number of the incentives that we have in place, they have worked quite well, but we couldn't, uh, with the legal basis that we have for the aid given uh, over spring, uh, what we could do here is only to give the necessary and proportionate, so to sort of stabilize things. And if you only give the necessary and, and proportionate, well, there is no sort of extra, there's no generosity uh, involved here that would then put claims on you. Uh, when it comes to green, uh, we can put claims on when it comes to competition, if you have a dominant position. Uh, but this is why we had sort of the uh, encouragement of member states uh, to do something, but not for us to make it a condition for the state aid approval. Thank you. Now we are moving to uh, European Aluminium, Emanuele Manigrassi, um, who is uh, talking about the costs of uh, breakthrough decarbonization technologies for greening energy intensive industries in Europe, uh, which uh, according to him are in most cases too high and the business care is often not there at all to attract private and public finance. So according to you, Margaret, what tools can EU competition and state aid policy put in place to support investments in these technologies in Europe and not elsewhere? So uh, according to, to him, the cost of breakthrough dec decarbonization technologies for greening energy intensive industries in Europe are in most cases too high. And so how, um, which tool can EU competition and state aid put in place to support investments in these technologies uh, and not elsewhere than in Europe? Uh, here, I, I think a number of different tools will have to work together. Uh, first, of course, that there is a demand uh, for green products. Also, products from, from energy intensive uses can be steel, aluminium, fertilizers, uh, paper. Uh, uh, all the things, uh, chemicals, uh, that comes from energy intensive uses. And here, of course, for instance, thinking about uh, building requirements, uh, that those who set sort of the building standard should say, well, if you want to claim that this is a, 
a neutral building, then you also have to use materials for that building uh, that are produced in a way so that themselves are carbon neutral. Second thing is, of course, to say, well, uh, we may need this border adjustment mechanism uh, because if we are challenging European producers to become uh, neutral uh, when it comes to carbon, well, they should not be undermined uh, by production from territories where they do not do the same effect. Uh, because ultimately, of course, we want everyone to do the same thing uh, to save the, the planet when it comes to climate change. But, but these two things will have to, to work together. And then on the projects by themselves, uh, part of the logic of this uh, hydrogen project is exactly to involve uh, energy intensive users to see, well, is this a, a production that would benefit from changing from present, maybe very carbon intensive uh, production to uh, a hydrogen as an energy source uh, instead, and then be part of some of these projects where state aid uh, can actually um, cover uh, Basically, if uh, the state wants to do that, uh, all of the funding gap between the private investment of the company and then what is needed actually to make the investment happen. Thank you. I'm afraid I think we'll have to uh, take the last question, but we have many, so it's a real success, I was sure. Thank you, Margaret. So, last question from uh, Theophil Brutz from Leiden University. Uh, so, this is the uh, academic uh, community. Um, Renew Europe France advocated for a European Bank of Climate. How would you welcome this policy and how would it fit under the competition rules? I promise I didn't ask him to speak about that because it was renaissance. Uh, but I think this is most welcome to, for the, the European Investment Bank to be sort of Europe's green bank. Uh, I think this is, this is uh, fits like hand in glove. It completely dovetails uh, all we want to do. Uh, already now we see that um, sort of green bonds is a great success in Europe. Uh, and we also see the market developing a lot uh, for this. Uh, also because I think the demand for, for many people who say, well, my pension funds, they should be managed in a way that actually supports this. There is a number of things that I don't want to see my pension funds go to. So you see also very large investors uh, going for, for this uh, project. And as Pascal Confin uh, said in the beginning, uh, just a few years ago, I think this was unthinkable and then it happened very fast uh, in a combination, I think, of market forces uh, and political forces. So I think this is most welcome because it's, it's part of changing also the market conditions so that you get sort of greening as, as part of market conformity and not as, as an extra, as an add-on, as something special, but as mainstream. And that, of course, is the point of having a long-term strategy is to make it mainstream so that carbon emission, emission, emissioning uh, industries and, uh, and coal and, and hardcore fossil fuels, that becomes the exception. And the main rule becomes the fact that we are greening uh, our economy, our ways of producing energy and our ways of using it as well. So I, I very much welcome this uh, development. Thank you. Um, well, we're, since we are, um, we, are, we are now nearly at the end of the uh, of this webinar. I'm sorry uh, for uh, some of the people who asked some questions, but I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to uh, repeat this uh, very good uh, webinar again. Um, a lot of thank you to you, Margaret, for coming to the European Parliament, which is a very good sign. And I do appreciate that for sharing your views also uh, without taboos, for inviting us all. As you said that, uh, you said, since we, 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 I mean, anyone who feel he has a stake in this uh, is welcome. And I think we all have an interest in this field, in this topic. So uh, it's definitely going to be a success. It's a very good, very good start. And, um, and I also appreciated, I have noticed um, the key role of the European Parliament you highlighted. And, so it's, um, it was a real pleasure. And thank you for announcing the launch of this debate during this webinar. Uh, thanks to all the people who uh, um, connected to, uh, through the, the, the Streamline platform. Have you seen even all the questions? This is a very hot topic. 
uh, and uh, everybody is very interested, ranging, as you said, from uh, the MEPs, the people from the European Commission, from national competition authorities, from uh, trade associations, from uh, business or academic community. So we are all looking forward to contributing to, uh, to it. And I guess uh, we will have the chance and opportunity to follow it up. So thanks again, many thanks. And please feel free to come here whenever you want and have a nice afternoon. Thank you. And think renew. Thank you very much. Thank you for organizing. I think we should applaud our host. It has been wonderful. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thanks, Margaret. Bye-bye. See you all soon.